Welcome everybody to our Heat Smart case study webinar series. I'm just going to give people just another minute to sign on. So um, make yourselves comfortable, grab another cup of coffee, and we'll be getting going in just a moment. I'm going to also get us going live on Facebook now. So um, let people trickle in, but we'll get started here because we want to get um, through our presentations and make time for your questions and make sure that we are done um, by one o'clock at the latest. So welcome again. My name is Lisa Marshall. I am the Heat Smart Program Director, Heat Smart um, Tompkins, but we also cover Chemung County, which is actually where I live. Um, and we um, have a great presentation for you today from one of our newest partners, Lamort Electric, which is based right up in Danby. And we have, um, they're going to walk you through their project of a recent install in Fall Creek, and we have the homeowner on with us. So thanks, Armin, for joining us. So um, Zoom protocol, make sure you're muted during the presentation. Um, feel free to type questions into the chat during the presentation, and then afterwards, you, um, people will be able to unmute and ask questions either out loud or, or typed questions work too. So um, I'm just going to go ahead and share my screen, and we'll get started here. Um, with our presentation. Oh, whoops, I keep doing that. So hold on. I don't wanna show you the Facebook Live. What I wanna show you is my slides. Okay, now I'm gonna share my screen. So as I said, I'm Lisa Marshall with Heat Smart Tompkins and we are a community nonprofit. We don't make any profit off of any sales. Uh, we're just here for education, outreach and support to the community. Uh, to think about home and building energy efficiency improvements that you can make, uh, which will save you money, increase your home comfort, and be also a very important key solution to, um, to climate change, um, to reducing our carbon emissions. And I've recently, so we call that the fourth, four C's, the cost, the comfort, and the climate. And I've recently answered, added this fourth C of convenience, because I'm finding more and more people really are seeking a more convenient heating solution than the one they have right now. So as I said, we are um, called Heat Smart. We're one of the 20 or so NYSERDA clean heating and cooling communities around the state. NYSERDA is the New York State Energy Research and Development Authority, and that's who funds Heat Smart. So actually it's funded by all of you every month when you pay your utility bill, you pay a small charge called the systems benefit charge. And that's what funds NYSERDA and all of their great energy programs and pays um, the bills here at Heat Smart. So thank you so much for doing that. But I love to show this um, slide, not only to show how many, um, how many New Yorkers are served by these Heat Smart programs, but also it's a little bit of bragging rights for Heat Smart Tompkins because before NYSERDA got involved, we actually pioneered the idea of the Heat Smart program. And NYSERDA thought it was such a good idea that they decided to fund us and to make it a statewide program. And we're really, really proud of the role we've played in um, moving this work forward in New York. So why the heck do we need such a thing as a local community-based clean heating and cooling nonprofit like Heat Smart? That is because um, most of you already know this, probably all of you, we find ourselves in the midst of what we call the climate crisis or the climate emergency. Um, you know, just yesterday, uh, we had some extreme weather um, that came over from California, hit us in the state, causing some uh, pretty bad problems. And, and, you know, this kind of extreme weather is getting worse and worse each year because of the mounting heat in the atmosphere. And that heat is there because it's trapped by the so-called greenhouse gases. Those are um, come from many sources, but the main uh, source of these greenhouse gases is the burning of fossil fuels. So we have to figure out as a state, as a country, as a nation, as a humanity, how we're gonna work together to reduce these greenhouse gas emissions. Because for the last 200 years, we've emitted more of them each year than we did the year before. So this is a pretty tough nut to crack um, and we're all figuring it out together. The first thing we have to look at is where do the emissions come from? And here in New York, a, about a third of those emissions come from the on-site combustion of fossil fuels in our buildings. And in fact, I disagree with this graphic. I would actually consider this to be a bigger source than transportation because this does not include 
the leaked methane from the gas that, it, that most of us are using to heat our buildings. And now we're very fortunate that we've passed a law in New York that actually requires us to reduce those emissions. That's called the CLCPA or the Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act. And so as a state, we're working together to figure out how to um, actually make that law a reality and heat smart is a, is a small part of that. So when we look at how we use energy in our houses, um, we can see from this graphic, this is Minnesota, but it's not too different than New York, another cold climate state. The majority is heating and air conditioning and actually most of that is heating. I wish, I, I need a different graphic that really shows that air conditioning is a tiny sliver. Uh, a lot of New Yorkers don't have any air conditioning, uh, me included. So it's mostly heating. And then um, our water heating is also a big piece, about 15%. I've seen also 17% or 20% for the average New York home. So these two areas, heating and water heating, are what we focus on at HeatSmart on trying to figure out how to do those more efficiently um, so that we use less energy and, um, and reduce those fossil fuel emissions. So our re recommendations are to sort of do a couple of things. One is to assess the building envelope. That's um, the insulation and the air sealing in your building or your home. Um, because basically, no matter how what technology you're using to create that warm air on a cold day or air conditioned air on a cool day, you want that conditioned air to stay inside the building with you instead of go right out the window or right out the roof. Um, so it's important to look at the building envelope. And secondly, and um, what we talk about the most at HeatSmart is our space heating and cooling. And what we recommend for that are the highly efficient technology of heat pumps, air source heat pumps and ground source heat pumps. Um, heat pumps are really efficient because they don't create the heat. They take heat that already exists. It's actually the sun's thermal energy out of the air and out of the ground and they move it around and make it useful for heating a home, a building, a space. Um, and they can also be used in reverse to provide cooling or air conditioning. And that same technology can also be used to heat your hot water. So here's some different kinds of heat pumps. On the left here, we have the classic air source heat pump um, called a mini split. And that's, um, I think, what um, you're going to hear about in the case study later on today. These are very uh, practical and adaptable little units. The, this is the outdoor compressor. This is the line that the refrigerant goes through and it goes to an indoor either floor or wall mounted head that distributes the warm or cool air. Um, in the middle here, we have the ground source heat pumps, sometimes called geothermal heat pumps. So what happens here is you have a, either vertical or horizontal uh, loop field in the ground that collects the heat from the from the ground which is about 50 degrees all year round and takes that into the house here's the heat pump that actually um, puts that um, that warmed water through a refrigerant process and then distributes the cool or the warm air in through the house and this little guy can also um, these these ground source heat pumps can also be configured to heat your hot water as well and then this is the standalone heat pump water heater it's basically just an electric resistance water heater, but with this little heat pump on top that preheats the water. And because the heat pump is doing that preheating, it's much more efficient than a standard electric water heater. Um, just a quick note about insulation and air sealing. Um, this, together, we call these two um, things weatherization, home weatherization. And insulation is like wearing this warm wool sweater uh, it definitely helps keep your house warm, but it doesn't seal that air inside. So um, for that, you need this windbreaker on top of the sweater to, um, and that's the air sealing part. Sometimes people are confused about insulation versus air sealing. It's even more confusing because some products like spray foam do both at the same time. They both insulate and air seal. So um, that's the end of my presentation. I'm um, looking forward to hearing from Sarah Schnabel from Lamort. But first, I'm going to play you a um, little video that we made about um, Lamort Electric our, our, um, when they joined the Heat Smart program earlier this summer. And I just wanted to see to make sure that we were optimized for um, playing this video. So I'm going to do that. OK, so. Hi, I'm 
Brian Lamore. Hi, I'm Sarah Schnabel. We are the co-owners of Lamort Electric Heating and Cooling. Um, I've owned Lamort Electric for about 11 years now. I've been a contractor. Uh, I really enjoy the work and I've had an interest for a long time in trying to help people save energy and now it's become a matter of using energy differently. This is my partner and girlfriend, Sarah Schnabel. Mm -hmm. Yes, hi. I've been with Lamore Electric since I graduated college in 2017. Um, I've, owned, I've, <laughs> I've been an owner of the business since 2018 and we've gone through a lot of transitions in that period, starting out just with electric work with Brian and I in the field and transitioning into doing um, heat pumps which has required me to do a lot more of the ad administration work because there's a lot more in designing the systems and in uh, applying for the rebates and things like that. I'm more the back end person. I, I help with estimates. We go out and do a, a heat load calculation. and So I do a lot of the sitting behind the computers unless I'm at someone's house doing an estimate. Um, I help a little bit with the estimate on the front end, though Sarah really does most of the design. Um, she orders the material, I show up with the trailer and start the install. Um, we've had one employee who's been with us for a few years now and uh, he's worked out great. We're getting ready to hire another one. We really like Mitsubishi because they've been around the longest. Uh, they're the most established, and as we were talking to different suppliers, they were by far the best at support and training and making sure we have everything that we need to do a good job. Yeah, I don't think we would have been able to make the transition into doing, having heat pumps be pretty much our sole um, business without Mitsubishi support and their training. And they have the longest warranty, which is nice. <laughs> Our process when somebody hires us, uh, once they approve an estimate, is we get a deposit check and we order the gear right away and then we put it here in our shop so that it's ready to go by the time we're scheduled for your install. I think one of our big things is attention to detail and we also want to be very thoughtful about how people use their space because these systems are so versatile that one multiple different people can have multiple different designs and they will operate somewhat differently and especially for comfort so we do um, take a lot of spend a lot of time with uh, individual customers going over their existing system what they want what their goals are um, usually our estimates are anywhere from an hour to an hour and a half and that's a mix of me going around taking measurements of the house and Brian answering questions or me chiming in with answers and things like that. So we do t uh, spend a lot of time with our estimates with people. We joined the HeatSmart um, program uh, for a couple reasons. One, we would like to grow and two, we think that changing our, our heating systems in homes is one of the biggest ways to combat climate change. Um, getting rid of our own personal combustion engines in our houses is, uh, is the goal. back to my slides here. Um, yeah. So actually I need to stop sharing because without any further ado, after that introduction, I'm going to turn it over to Sarah herself um, to share this really fun um, example of some of the work they um, do right here in Tompkins County. So take it away, Sarah. Sure. Okay. I will screen share. Can you all see that? Looks great. Okay. Well, uh, I won't have, I had some notes on uh, our little bit of our history, but most of that was covered uh, in that video. So let's see if I know how to control this. Oh, there we go. So yeah, we started, uh, or Brian started the business in 2010 um, as an electrical contractor. We started moving into, uh, heating and cooling in around mid to late 2018. Um, our main goal was to install heat pumps, but we kind of started with like a lot of everything. So we were, if we couldn't convince someone that a heat pump was right for them, then we, we 
had a few installs where we would uh, swap out someone's furnace or things like that, but it just didn't feel right based on uh, our own philosophies for uh, the climate crisis that we're in right now. Uh, so toward uh, middle of 2019, we made the decision to no longer touch anyone's fossil fuel system unless it was to decommission it. Um, yes, and then uh, we uh, became Heat Smart Partners, what was it, the end of July of this year, 2021, so fairly new. Uh, what else was I going to say? <laughs> One of, um, I think this is a good word to kind of describe us as a business and where we see ourselves going, uh, but Brian likes to call himself an electrificationist. Try and say that three times fast. Um, where we're trying to move all of our um, energy consumptions to electric because that's the only potentially renewable source. I know there's issues with where we get our um, electric and things like that, but you can't do that without changing everything over in your houses. Um, but so we um, we can do all of the electric work. So we do service upgrades, car chargers, water heaters, and air source heat pumps. So it's all that kind of electrifying your home where, uh, yes, okay. So the house that we're talking about today, um, we chose because it's a very typical install style for us. It's also a very typical house for the Ithaca area. Um, it's a Fall Creek house. It's over 100 years old. It was built in 1890. It's a roughly 1,500 square feet, uh, and it, it's a three-bedroom house all on the second floor, and it has a natural gas furnace, which is very common for that area. As soon as you get outside of the city, there's a lot more um, boilers, and then you get a lot more um, oil and propane and things like that, but um, we thought this was a good example because of so going into this house, because it, I knew it was 100 years old, we had it, some houses in the Fall Creek area are have had no insulation or air sealing upgrades. But this house is, is an example of having done all of the necessary work before considering the air source heat pump. So this house had all blown in insulation in all the walls and in the attic. Um, and then in there, uh, the rim joist, which is in the basement up at the top where it's slightly exposed was also sealed. And those are like the big things that we look for when we're going on a site visit is we don't wanna put in a heat pump that's just gonna have your heat leave through your walls or your attic, your attic is the big one. Um, this house, we also previously, I think about a year ago or so, um, upgraded their electrical service. So they had the appropriate electrical capacity and they had a level two charger. And down here in the corner, you can see my little uh, insulation inspector, my cat who's uh, totally destroyed our insulation in the walls, but she helps me with my estimate all the time. Um, so before, actually, I'll just go through this first and then we'll, um, have Armin, the homeowner, uh, give us a little bit of um, his thoughts on the process. So after we had completed our site visit, um, I usually, I come home, our site visits are on Fridays. So Mondays and Tuesdays, I do all of our heat load calculations and then I come up with a design. This one, there were two options that we could consider. Um, we could have considered replacing the furnace with, uh, with an air handler that would, uh, looks somewhat like the furnace, but because this house was ducted for heating, there wasn't adequate um, return on the second floor. So for air conditioning, it wouldn't operate quite as well. And you would also lose out on the comfort of zoning um, the system. And a lot of people just don't like ductwork because you're moving dust and things around your house through this uh, air handler. So the design we ended up coming with, uh, coming up with is a very typical for how we lay it out. We like having multiple smaller um, outdoor compressors um, for a couple of reasons. Um, the one-to-one -one units, which is this one in the bottom left corner, is um, it's one outdoor compressor to one indoor unit, one indoor high wall, which looks like this one. I don't, can you guys see my cursor? Yes. Okay, it looks like this one. 
And you can also see the picture down here that shows it's one outdoor compressor to one indoor. Um, those are very efficient. Um, the Mitsubishi came out with this year, their Hyperheat Plus. So most of their Hyperheats, which are their cold climate heat pumps will uh, heat at 100% capacity down to five degrees, but these Hyperheat Plus models will go down to negative five degrees. And you also get more um, capacity, heating capacity out of them. So we had one of these one-to-ones for the larger kitchen area, which had a vaulted ceiling, which means it needed a slightly more heating because the, you'll have to heat the air above it before it gets to, down to the lower portion. Um, and then it also covers their office, which I believe Armin is in right now, because there's a fairly large um, opening in between the two and it points right at it. And then, uh, then we had a uh, three zone, um, multi-zone system which covered the two, there's a unit in each of the two larger bedrooms upstairs, and then one for the living room slash entryway. Uh, we did not put a unit in the smallest bedroom on the second floor, because it was quite small, about 90 square feet or so. And it also already had an electric baseboard in there for supplemental heating. It's also a room that they don't tend to use that often. Um, so... So cost for this system, um, the cost would have been around 18,500 minus the rebate from NYSERDA or NYSEG, kind of both uh, at about um, $4,800. And then whenever we do a job that is a check payment, we build in a slight amount for financing charges and things like that into our amount. So people who pay with uh, Cash is honestly a little harder. We like checks because it's easy for me to mobile deposit on my phone, but there's a 5% discount for that. So then the cost of the homeowner for this one was just under 13,000. And the way we deal with payments is we do a deposit, especially with current supply chain issues. We try and get that as soon as we can and order material. There is, uh, unfortunately I'm hearing some water heater issues for the brand that we use, um, not being able to get in in the next couple months, but that's a whole other issue. So that's our cost breakdown. And there's my little cat smudge helping me out with my estimates, totally rolling around. I'm surprised she's not on the keyboard. She usually is. <laughs> and uh, benefits to, uh, for this system. I think, I'm, I'm sure Armin can speak to this, but uh, I know AC was a, a consideration. Um, the zoned comfort is also, um, beneficial because you can zone it. Um, each of the each of the high wall units from the previous slide has its own controller, and you can control one room when you're not in there. You can turn it down if you want. We don't recommend having it too drastic of a change, just because the way these units operate, they like to kind of maintain the temperature in the spaces. Um, as far as cost of operation, because this is a natural gas furnace um, swap out, well, we left it in place, but. Uh, because we're replacing the natural gas, we, we say the cost is about um, equal, but I don't know if anybody's been reading the news, but it looks like natural gas prices are gonna be starting to go up. And I don't see that changing in the next five to 10 years for the lifespan of this system or 15 to 20 probably is more like the um, range. But I know for our own house, when we, um, we swapped out a similar uh, natural gas furnace, and we ended up saving a little money because the one half of our house is almost never used. Um, so that's on a separate system that we turn off when uh, Brian's kids aren't at home. And uh, oh, also the, because a lot of ductwork is somewhat older installed, unless it's like brand new construction, a lot of it is not sealed very well or insulated well. So there's a lot of duct loss, um, which can help with these uh, help with some costs. Um, I think the climate impact was covered very well by HeatSmart. That's the main reason we're doing this. Um, and health and safety. Um, air quality, I think, is a good one, especially when you're replacing a ducted system. You are no longer running all your air that you're breathing through these, these ducted systems that are like who knows when the last time they were cleaned. Most people have never had their um, ducted systems cleaned. But this is not a, um, there's a, a story I have, not from this house, but a recent house that we just did an install for. Um, we had them lined up to do their install in December. Um, they called us, they said they had 
they had a natural gas steam boiler, those steam radiators. And they were gonna try and just get it up and running until we came in and did our install in December. But they had someone come out and check out their system before they turned it on, which is good because it turns out the system, they had just moved into the house, but it turns out that system was spewing carbon monoxide into their house. So had they just turned it on, they hopefully they had uh, batteries in their CO detectors, but that is always a consideration when you have any kind of combustible gas in your house. Um, but yeah, that was a little bit of a scare. So we bumped them up in our schedule and got their install done last week, I think. Um, and then there's our little dog enjoying his heat pump in, in our living room. I say little, he's 130 pounds, but. <laughs> um, okay, and then if you were interested in considering heat pumps as your option, uh, the best way to reach out to us or any of the HeatSmart contractors is to go to, to uh, HeatSmart's uh, enroll page, which is, they started out at Solar Tompkins, but solartompkins.org forward slash enroll. Um, when you fill out that enrollment form, you can have the option of choosing um, one or multiple of the six installers for either air sealing or heat pumps. Um, and then if you choose us, you will automatically get an uh, automated email from me introducing ourselves. So that does kind of make the process quite simple. Did I cover everything? Oh, there was one thing I wanted to cover, why we didn't consider a hybrid water heater in this house. Um, they had a fairly new um, on-demand natural gas water heater, but with this house, this is also um, something that is very typical for the downtown area in Ithaca, is very, very short basements. So the, these systems are quite tall. You need about six, six feet, six and a half feet of um, clearance. While we would love to, to um, be able to put these in every home, um, I think that they might have to either make a shorter, wider unit or something, but uh, um, an on-demand heater, I think is a fairly decent option. Um, it is fossil fuel, but it's, uh, if you're gonna have a fossil fuel system, it's one of the fewer, um, Less bad, I guess, is how to say it. <laughs> yeah, so I think that is a quick That's overall awesome. of what happened. Your, um, why don't you unshare and we'll just um, give the mic over to Armin, the homeowner of this lovely Fall Creek home. Um, someday I'll live in Fall Creek, life goals. <laughs> anyway, uh, and the I'll best be painted house in town. <laughs> yeah, I'll be able to walk the things instead of be stuck in my stupid car. But um, Armin, love to know, you know, uh, how, why you decided to get in touch with Lamort and um, how you like your heat pumps sure. and uh, say hi to the folks. Sure, sure. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm, I'm going to make a small correction. We live in the north side neighborhood, which is the triangle that's uh, contained by Cascadilla Creek, uh, Route 13 and um, and uh, and uh, Cascadilla Street. So it's actually a separate neighborhood than Fall Creek, but we always get called Fall Creek because we're getting continually subsumed by the Fall Creek neighborhood in a good way. Um, yes, in my mind, it's the lowland. It's not yes, the hills, so. Yeah, the flats, you know. And uh, so so to answer your questions, first of all, um, I, I, I just jotted down some notes. My number one consideration for um, choosing a uh, heat pump um, is the same consideration that we used when choosing to um, switch uh, from a plug-in hybrid to a full electric car. Um, I care a great deal about the climate um, crisis, and I've been reading about it and studying it for years, like so many other people. And uh, one thing that I uh, learned recently, not too far, not too long ago, was um, the EPA. EPA has a website with dated information, dated back to 2018, where they compare the, um, the carbon footprint of the grid in every, sec in every grid region in the United States. Turns out that New York State, as of 2018, had the absolute cleanest grid, cleaner than California, and it was largely due to um, hydroelectric in Niagara Falls. And then, you know, so I went down the rabbit hole of researching heat pump systems and um, the effectiveness of decarbonizing in different parts of the country. So it turns out that if you're decarbonizing in New York State, you get the biggest bang for the buck in terms of um, 
global climate impact or, or national climate impact. Does, does that make sense? So in other words, if you're a uh, if you're in a state or a region like somewhere in Texas or something like that, where mostly coal plants and uh, and I'm sure you both know more about this than I do, but where where the grid is has a real high carbon footprint, running an electric car doesn't have the same impact that it does here in New York State. And please correct me if I'm mistaken. Um, but so that was that was correct, hundred percent correct. Okay, so that that was really a huge consideration. So we went electric car. Turns out electric cars are way more fun to drive. I don't like driving. I, I live close to my workplace. Um, I choose to live near my workplace so that I don't have to drive as much. I prefer bicycling, just it's more fun. Um, but you know, so uh, so um, electric car first, and then I thought, well, okay, heat pump. And then I had two friends who um, had uh, heat pump systems installed. And they both recommended the same um, same company, and that's how I landed on on Lamort. Um, the second consideration for for us uh, was summer comfort. I don't like air conditioning units. Um, we had you know the window air conditioning units that you pop in, um, highly inefficient, really noisy, and they don't really do a good job. And I also feel really guilty when I run air conditioning. But honestly, in our aged house, it's uh, it really. You, you, it's oppressive heat in the summertime during certain weeks and months, and it feels like the summers are getting hotter and hotter. Um, so I wanted to replace the window AC units. You don't want to feel so trapped in your house, right? Um, the third consideration was the actual quality of air. So what I had been reading about heat pump systems, and I, it has yet to be proven to me, but I believe it, it's going to happen, that the, the air quality in the wintertime will not be as dry when you have forced hot air. I think the air gets really, really dried out. And we, have, we all have sort of skin issues and things like that, and constant moisturizing, and it's like the air just doesn't feel good. Um, and then there's that whole other element of how clean the air is from the ductwork and things like that. Um, so we've now been living with, the, uh, with our mini splits for a little over a month now, I'm two months, I can't even keep track anymore. And the quality of the, the heating, it, it's, first of all, it's very subtle. Uh, you, you don't know that it's on, there's no noise. Um, if you get really close to the mini split, you hear a little, little noise, but um, it's so not disruptive. Uh, whereas the furnace, you just, the rattle of the whole house and the whole ductwork was really noticeable. Um, then in terms of the, just the general air quality that we feel from the mini splits, um, if it just feels so natural, right? Uh, we have, we have uh, three, no, wait, I'm sorry, we have two mini splits upstairs. And so far we have barely used them because we like to sleep in a really cold room. And so we don't, I don't even know when we're going to use them, except for in the summertime when we want to um, cool down the upstairs. So the great thing about zoning uh, when it, with a mini split system, uh, you, you only have to heat or cool the spaces that you're living in. And we're empty nesters now, so um, we're selective about where we apply heat. And that whole, that whole idea of, where, of selectively applying heating and cooling to specific places doesn't work for um, you know, a forced hot air system. And it also doesn't really work that well for um, a, a unit that goes in the window in the kitchen or in the living room. So um, <clears throat> it, yes, it's more expensive than natural gas uh, in terms of the installation, but I felt the same way about electric, of uh, electric car. Um, if we're leasing an electric car because I think technology is changing so rapidly and um, I'll never drive another internal combustion. I'll never own another internal combustion vehicle in my life. The cost of running and maintaining an electric car is actually way lower. Uh, everything about it is just, it just feels right. And um, I also am a believer in consuming less. So it's not just about gadgetry, um, but I do, th I, I would like to see a rapid transition to elect yeah, everything electric, everything plugged in, that whole decarbonized movement. I didn't need anyone to convince me of that other than because people like Bill McKibben from the founder of 350.org um, and this podcast called How to Save a Planet 
uh, it's a Gimlet podcast, um, had me really pretty much convinced that this is the way that we have to move forward. And, um, and I'm hoping that more and more people start to realize on their own, and then Ithaca has its own initiative to try, to, it's, that they're starting up right now evidently, to basically provide uh, either zero interest or low interest loans for uh, residents of the city to decarbonize. And I think that's a real forward looking proposition. And I hope that um, a lot of my neighbors do it because I look around, it's funny when you get a heat pump system, you look at how many condenser units you have outside um, in your neighborhood and they're not too many. Uh, it's but like it's, they all of a sudden start like have like a highlighter on them. You just start seeing it everywhere. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Just like when you buy that new car and everyone's, oh, they, they have my same car. So that, yeah. that, there's that whole movement. <laughs> So um, I know I've talked a lot. I so, I'm sorry. Oh, that. Armin, no, that was so fantastic. Yeah, that was great. Um, you so, said it better than I could ever could. <laughs> yeah, uh, I was thinking, um, hmm, wonder if Armin wants to join the Heat Smart Board. Anyway, uh, we'll talk about that <laughs> another time. Um, so folks, this is uh, your chance to ask questions. I'm going to start with the questions in the chat. Um, Amalia asked what the noise level was. Armin said it's so incredibly quiet. I piled on to say, I am very noise sensitive and I hate mechanical and electronic noises and the heat pumps don't bother me at all. They're so, so quiet. Armin said, it's a, just a very gentle heat. Um, one of the things Armin and um, Sarah did not mention is that um, it's an adjustment how you use the, the mini splits because um, we're used to doing this thing where we turn down the heat way down at night and then turn it way up in the morning. You can't, that's not a nice thing to do to a heat pump. Um, they, it's it's that what the uh, manufacturers and the installers say is, you know, set it and forget it, let it just do its work. It's actually more efficient to do it that way. So we have to break our old habits and learn um, how heat pumps like to be treated. <laughs> um, I'm thinking about Armin's situation with the hot water because I also have that on-demand gas water heater that we got you know 10 12 years ago it was supposed to be the best thing but what isn't counted in the efficiency of those is there's actually um a pretty big loss of methane every time that thing fires up into the environment and we know what a bad impact methane has on on climate change and also just like when you're thinking about like armin said he's an empty nester i'm an empty nester starting to think about retirement and living on a fixed income you will, i look forward to the day when i can say nice egg cut off the gas from my house i don't want you don't need to deliver gas here anymore so hopefully um the next five years we'll find a um water heater solution um for, that's going to work for armin's house and so that we can get more and more all oh, electric i am um, game i am totally game actually <laughs> Um, yeah, I, I've tried I, to reach out to our supplier to see if they know of anything in the works because they said that is probably the biggest issue is that while it's the same footprint of a regular tank water heater, they are so much taller um, yeah. that like a shorter, wider one. I think that's ideal. certainly in the works. They do low voice for other, you know, applications. So why not? Yeah. Right. Exactly. So, and Scott has a question. Um, can you talk a little more about the minimum temperature which the unit can work? I think you said five below. No, it definitely that's, works below five below. Yeah, that's what um, the manufacturer says is their one hundred percent capacity. Um, they, some of the units have no known limit um, from Mitsubishi anyway. When we had that polar vortex in the Midwest a couple years ago, there were units that were operating at negative thirty ambient temperature. Um, they are rated down to negative 13, but from what I can tell, and it, I've seen how they operate, they, that's, um, Mitsubishi's kind of like guaranteed limit, but they work a lot lower than that. Um, and that's ambient temperature. That's not wind chill. Um, and here in this area, we are required to size heating systems to zero degrees, which is the 99% mark. So over the course of like um, low temperatures, we average about 99% of the time above zero degrees. So when we size systems, we size them to that temperature um, with usually about like 105% ish of that um, 
amount to on for the off days where you might need more. It also just means when it's lower temperature than that, your electric meter will spin a little bit more, but overall in the course of the year, it that averages out. Yeah, yeah which leads me to um, saying that, you know, um, one thing about HeatSmart, all of our installers are, it, it, any plumber or electrician could probably slap a mini split in your home, right? But it's more than just the install, it's the design that is really important. And it really, design is very key to having an efficient operating system that keeps your house warm and that keeps you cool. If it's too big, it actually is a problem. It cycles on and off too often. If it's too small, it's trying to keep up. And it's not just sizing. It's also like where it's placement, it's airflow. So there is, you know, a lot that goes into it. So, um, you know, one of the things we look for with our contractor partners is that know-how and that expertise. So, um, Rhonda asks, is Lamort a diamond Mitsubishi diamond level contractor? You want to explain are. Mitsubishi and what? Sure. Um, Mitsubishi has this uh, pretty much a diamond label that they just kind of give out to contractors that they know are doing good work. Um, we became a diamond contractor in late 19. Um, and this past year, we kind of stepped because they have three tiers of diamond level um, installers. We're now a preferred diamond dealer one step up so that's nice um, but what's really nice about working with diamond dealer contractors is that you get that full 12 year <coughs> warranty where anyone else if they um, just buy a Mitsubishi product they'll get um, five years compressor and seven years on parts which is a lot less than 12 years on parts and compressor so. and that's also how they how and why they give us all the support that they give us is um, because we have that diamond dealer status. Yeah, and so, you know, the the fact that Lamort is exclusively a Mitsubishi dealer and is a diamond dealer, you know, that has advantages for you as a customer. Um, and another thing we look for in our contractor partners is really um, a dedication to being able to service and repair all the units that they put in. And, um, you know, like I've begged Sarah and Brian to go a little bit outside of their radius for installing because I just thought they were a really good fit for a particular customer and they're very strict. They're like, nope, not doing it. We're only sticking within this radius because we want to make sure we can take really good care of all our customers. So, um, you know, um, they're not it's really nice when a lot of our installs are right around the corner and if somebody's having an issue, we can just swing through especially um, when it's close, like recently after the install, some people just may have like one unit in the cooling mode and the other one in heating mode and they don't like that. So we'll just swing through, um, kind of show them and then leave, no need to bill when you're five or 10 minutes away. That's right. So, um, you know, uh, sorry for my Shimon County resident um, that they can't get Lamort, but um, we have- Maybe other someday. Then we have other good installers that are, are willing to come the distance. So, um, but, but if you're, you know, in Tompkins County and in and, and Ithaca, Danby, um, Caroline, um, Newfield, that, that's pretty much just Tompkins County. We're okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, um, okay. So Armin mentioned in the chat that they're going to swap out their gas range for induction. That's one of the things that HeatSmart we're trying to start to talk about more is induction cooking, which is, magical cooking with magnets um, the <laughs> magnet and the cooktop interacts with the metal the iron in your pan if it's cast iron or stainless steel pan and um, heats that pan right up it's very precise it's very clean it's very um, it's very it doesn't heat up your kitchen in the summer uh, it's very safe and incredibly efficient so for people you know clinging to their gas stoves um, and I totally understand that um, you know, think, start thinking about your next stove or your next kitchen remodel doing induction. And um, I don't have a full induction range yet, but I have just an on the counter single burner one that I plug in. And so um, back to being an empty nester now, often I'm just, instead of, I used to be cooking for three kids right now, it's just me and my husband. So we're off Those one pot meals, one pot <laughs> meals and just cook it right on that. Um, and in the summer, it's just a lifesaver because it's just so hot in, in our kitchen. So it's really, really great. Um, yeah, I forgot that we ran the electric for the, the new stove. I'm sure it's a, a little bit difficult trying to get the unit at the moment, but 
Yeah, yeah it'll so be ready Lamort, when you get it. <laughs> so Lamort is also their electrician. So exactly that panel upgrade, that car charger, uh, the the um, the electrical serv service for you know the, the the right kind of plug for an an induction range, etc. All of that is think things they can provide and it's, it's good to sort of think about when you're thinking about the heat pump or the water heater you know what your future needs are and yeah. take a look at that service panel and make sure you get the amperage upgrade that you need yeah actually you know i should say that like like our path our pathway started with the level two charger because we were part of a pilot program um and that pilot program basically got us a free charger but we had to pay for a service upgrade and that sort of opened up my thinking about oh so all these things that I'm thinking about down down the road, I can think about them exactly right now. Um, in, when you get a, a, a better uh, or more service, you can then build in induction, build in uh, exactly. systems and all that kind of stuff. And it's just really, really good. But exactly. Ron, Rhonda has a question about how um, an air conditioner works. Now my wife, whenever, whenever that question gets asked of us, um, I try to explain it. And then she's, oh, it's just magic. It's just magic. <laughs> well, I will explain it. So the, um, the, um, air magical. <laughs> yes. Well, heat pumps are magic, but it's not magic. It's physics. There's physics and magic are kind of the same thing. Basically, yeah. Rhonda, the a heat pump runs on a refrigerant refrigeration system. A refrigerant is a chemical that, um, is very reactive to phase change. And when you change phases, you either can absorb or give off great, great amounts of heat. So when you put that chemical under low pressure, it evaporates. And when it evaporates, it can absorb a lot of heat. And when it, you condense it or put it under higher pressure, it condenses and, and gives off heat. And that's the simple physics. So if you wanna bring heat in, you run it in one direction. And if you wanna bring heat, kick heat out, you run it in the other direction. And that's, it's just totally reversible. It's the same technology that keeps the inside of your refrigerator cool. Yeah. Sarah, did you want to yeah. pile onto that? I mean, that was pretty accurate, but that is one thing I do consider when we're placing outdoor units is that you do want to consider that whatever it's doing inside, it's doing the opposite outside. Yeah. So if it's heating your inside, you don't want to put it right in front of your front door because there is a huge gust of cold air coming off of that unit. Yeah. Um, or the opposite it, in the summer, you don't want to be blasted with 90 degree Right, so air. you don't want to, like right next to your deck or patio where you like to eat outside in the summer and then have this warm air blowing on you. That's yeah, because the sound, because they're so quiet, sound is less of a concern. But because it's just like, like if you see a window unit air conditioner, if you stand outside by that window unit air conditioner, it's also blowing hot air. It's got a, it's transferring heat somewhere. Yeah, but yeah. it transfers heat from inside to outside and then the opposite in the winter. Yeah. And it's noisy and it's dripping on you. So yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's just so hard to fathom that you're not pulling the air from the outside and bringing it physically in, you know, or vice versa. No, nope, just the um, heat, just the heat energy. And people also, it's a little mind blowing. You think, how am I getting heat out of zero degree air? Well, there's still heat in the air, right? It's not zero degrees Kelvin. So still what, <laughs> 273 or something? Right, like exactly. Negative. <laughs> As long as that, you know, it doesn't, which we, we rarely see that on earth. So uh, there is heat energy in the air. Of course, the heat pump is working a lot harder on a colder day um, and, and the efficiency does drop way down, but we don't see, you know, day after day, week after week of zero degree weather here, um, you know, and so it's, it's, it's operating in its sweet spot for most of the year. You can expect to see for these air source heat pumps, a higher electricity bill, um, you know, um, if you've had one of those really cold months that bill and you want to budget for that or think ahead to that. I wanted to say a couple more things. Um, you know, uh, Sarah showed the price, uh, the um, Armin was a, a, you know, a, what we call a market rate customer, not eligible for extra grants, but a lot of our customers in HeatSmart are eligible for extra grants. Um, some of those can actually pay the full cost of the heat pump install. So if you, um, qualify now for heating assistance or for SNAP benefits, um, yeah, that you might be in that category and get in touch with HeatSmart to find out more about that. Um, another thing I wanted to say was that fourth C, that convenience. So I talk every day, uh, not in downtown Ithaca, but in the surrounding area, a lot of people still heating with wood, still heating with pellets, still heating with coal. 
um, getting up in years and starting to think, I don't think I can keep doing this. How much longer can I stay in my home? So the idea of this heat pump, which they can just turn on and off with a remote control um, and also get the air conditioning is really, really appealing to those folks who have, you know, I talk every day now to people who said, I've not, not been able to leave town and go on, you know, go to Florida or go away even for the weekend in the winter because I have to keep feeding the wood burner um, or the pellet stove. And so um, this, the convenience of a heat pump is really, is really, really magical for those folks. Um, um, Amalia wants to know, how does the heat pump affect humidity in the summer? It's great because yeah. <laughs> it dehumidifies as it runs, um, not as much as an actual dehumidifier, but um, I hear so many heat smart customers say that the air conditioning has changed their air quality. It, it's made people with asthma or any kind of breathing problems. It's made such a difference. Sarah and, and Armin, you might want to speak to the humidity thing. Yeah, so we haven't had much experience with um, air conditioning yet. But yeah, you got the tail we, end of the summer. Yeah, <laughs> the few days that we did, it was like so noticeable when you go outside from like a kind of clammy day and then you're coming into the house and it's, it's very it's very noticeable. So, um, and I think the reverse tr too um, is, is just as important. Think about how dry your air is with forced hot air. And I yeah. think from what I read, that's not going to be the case. Yeah. Yes, I know. Sarah, you want to say, I have wondered about that because people say, oh, well, I love the dehumidification in the summer, but what about in the winter when it's already dry? I mean, the natural air outside is dry, but the forced hot air or any kind of combustion just makes it even worse. And I know I get those cracked knuckles in the winter from, from the air. And this past winter, I haven't noticed it as much. Um, and I know this summer, I'm not the biggest fan of air conditioning. I like rooms to be somewhat warm, uh, but I kept our system at 78. So it was warm inside, but it was dry. And that honestly made the biggest difference because I don't necessarily want things freezing cold. And I know a lot of people like that, but it's that humidity that's so oppressive in the summer and getting worse in upstate. Yeah, and even if you, um you can run the heat pumps just in fan or dehumidifying mode. You don't even have to run them in cooling mode, right? They can, you can just run them. Um, if you, if you're, if you're not worried about the temperature, you just want to bring the humidity down a little bit and move the air around, you can run it like that. You can have just the fan turned on. Um, they do have a dehumidifying mode, but that kind of just overrides the temperature and it turns your inside into a meat locker but it will dehumidify very quickly. Oh, wow. um, so sometimes, yeah, sometimes you turn that on for 15 minutes and then you're good for like a couple days. <laughs> wow. Um, so question for Armin from Rhonda, what do you plan to use as backup heating source when the electricity goes off this winter? Ooh, that's a really good question. Well, let me ask, let me ask both of you, uh, does, a, does a natural gas furnace work when the electricity is out? It does not. So it's the same problem. It does Wood stove not. is honestly your true backup. It's your really your yeah. only true backup. So we've, we've we've lived in Ithaca for twenty five years now. Um, the longest stretch that we've gone without electricity in downtown Ithaca has been, I think, three hours. Yeah, that's not too bad. Also, um, since I also have the um, all electric car. There is a way to use your car battery as a backup generator for your house. I mean, it's not going to run your whole house for days and days and days, but um, I have the Leaf Plus, so I have a pretty big battery in my car. So you can get a, a, an adapter to use that as a generator. No kidding. Yeah, yeah. you can set up a, a transfer switch and have an exterior outlet on the outside that it's like a reverse outlet. Um, but we've also been considering at some point um, batteries, uh, battery backups, because the natural like um, response is, oh, a generator, but what do those run on? Propane, natural gas, whatever, um, fossil fuels, and they're not the cleanest, but I know <clears throat> it's uh, electric is definitely more a consideration out where uh, Rhonda lives out in South Danby Road. Uh, yeah. So out there, you're somewhat relying more on the grid that you're connected to, because I know where I am, we have pretty reliable electric as well, but out 
once you get off of main roads, it is more of a, a concern. But I think the the car option is going to be huge when everybody has electric cars. Absolutely. And also the potential battery backups, which we might need for demand charge, well, we're, like demand we're leaning, and things like that. We're leaning pretty heavily on the utilities, um, both locally and statewide, to um, really think about the electrification of cars and homes and the grid reliability and, um, the, and the ability to take on more renewable generation and battery storage thinking about things like local renewable microgrids of battery storage. There's a lot coming in. And I feel like those we will win infrastructure money can be used for that. The unions are very excited about that. So I feel like that is gonna happen. Um, and I, I realized I missed a question from Gina, which is for you, Sarah, do you disconnect and dispose of old furnaces slash water heaters? Yeah, if we're replacing someone's water heater, um, we just haul that right out of there. Um, Depending on the type of system, like if it's an oil uh, boiler or oil furnace, we won't remove the oil tanks, but we will like, if it's a boiler, we'll drain all the water out of it, disconnect it all, uh, disconnect the electric so it's safe um, to remove it. And we don't usually wanna touch people's propane tanks or their oil tanks. So have their suppliers deal with those kinds of things or potentially sell them. There's a market for that. Um, Absolutely. But yeah. At a any time, we're happy to free of charge disconnect people's uh, systems. And I think yeah. we left yours connected just because you wanted to be able to have your nest on the wall. You know, <laughs> I made a strategic error in deciding to keep uh, the natural gas furnace. Well, you, so. you, you can stop through again if you want. <laughs> so Rhonda was out of power for 52 hours. I just do want to point out one more thing about power outages, then that's getting back to paying attention to that building envelope. Because um, one of the things we learned in the Texas power outage, that horrible storm last year was how poorly insulated those Texas homes were. And most yeah. of those people would not have had burst pipes or some of the awful side effects of that um, terrible thing if they had had well insulated homes. So it's a good thing to think about your your insulation and there's you know you can you can wrap those water pipe, pipes with blankets and things you know um, it's it, you know it's it's just something to think about there is no sort of one perfect situation for a weather disaster and a major power outage and if and I think if, if we were without power for several days in a row um, all of us would pretty much be in trouble even if you have a wood stove it's not necessarily going to provide everything you need. Um, but we can sort of be thoughtful about our overall health of our house and and how we're sort of how well equipped we are for those um, for those really unfortunate um, you know um, you know we are going to be facing more and more extreme weather throughout the rest of our lives it's a reality so we do have to be thoughtful about that but um, it's kind of funny because that the heat pump thing if what are you going to do with power out it's such a gotcha question and people don't remember that every kind of heating system, pellet stove, whatever, um, relies on, relies, and even the wood stove, you know, the, most of them have an electric fan. So yeah, you can still burn wood, but you're not distributing that heat very well throughout your house. Yeah. So, anyway, um, this has been a great um, webinar, such a lively conversation. I'm sure we could keep going, but it is one o'clock and I want to let folks get back to their day, but um, feel free to reach out to Heat Smart. Um, and thank you so much um, to Sarah and Armin for this great discussion and presentation. I really appreciate your taking the time and just um, so happy to have you being part of the Heat Smart team. So thank you. Thank you. Hopefully thank I didn't you. ramble too much. No, no, not at all. <laughs> Although it was cringy watching myself, but you know. Oh, it's hard. I can't watch yourself. That's terrible i never do that okay thanks everybody and have a great day enjoy the beautiful sunshine <laughs>